Many, many, many things come to mind when I mention Gibson acoustic guitars. History, pedigree, innovation, the list goes on and on. And speaking of lists, on today's show, I'm gonna share with you my 10 favorite Gibson acoustic guitars ever made. I'm talking new, I'm talking vintage, I'm talking oddballs. They're all there and you're gonna to get to hear each of them. Hey Tech family, welcome to episode 245 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show. This show is designed to inject your guitar journey with a weekly dose of fun, focus, progress, and inspiration. A little bit later on today's show, we're gonna do something, well, a little bit different. I'll be addressing some questions, comments, and gripes from episode 241, where I spoke about the best acoustic guitar albums from the 80s. It is quite an emotionally charged segment, if I do say so myself. You're also gonna see what the TAC family is working on today. They are in the midst of a five-day bass walk challenge, and you're gonna see one of those bass walks today. And of course, your weekly dose of acoustic news awaits, which includes some new guitar lines, an epic on-stage guitar fail, and much, much more. But first, let's dive into my 10 favorite Gibson acoustic guitars ever built. Oh man, have I got a list for you today. My favorite Gibson acoustic guitars ever to be made. We've got vintage guitars, we've got newly made guitars, we've got really odd guitars. They're all represented here. And it's no doubt that this list will cause confusion. There will be some emotional moments on this list. This list might even stir the pot in some cases. In fact, the first guitar I'm gonna mention will likely stir the pot. So let's go ahead and dig in. We'll do this in a true countdown fashion, working up to my favorite Gibson acoustic guitar ever made. And it is one that I doubt you'll be able to guess. Go ahead and uh, if, you, if you fancy a guess, go ahead and put one in the comments below. Uh, let's start on number 10. Coming in at number 10 is the Gibson True Vintage J45. This is a newly made J45 to sound like an old J45. And I think the recipe is magic. I had a chance to play one of these back when I was doing demos for the acoustic letter and it knocked my socks off. Now, I'm not sure they're making the True Vintage J45 right now. However, I believe they are making similar guitars. Uh, specific with uh, uh, specific years in mind. Uh, Gibson changes their acoustic lineup quite a bit. So I've never had a firm grasp on what they're up to, but I will say that the True Vintage J45 is a standout guitar in my opinion. So let's go ahead and give it a listen. Now I know what you're already thinking. You're thinking, okay, that's, that's a cool guitar, but you gotta have an actual vintage J45 on your list. And I don't, I do not have an actual vintage J45 on my list. And you're thinking to yourself, Tone, you've gone off the deep end, why? Well, first of all, let me say this, vintage J45s sound awesome. No doubt, I've played plenty of them. They have this woody, wonderful character and they sound like a vintage J45. It's a very signature sound. However, I feel like a true vintage J45 from the 40s or something like that is rather cost prohibitive. And I wanted this list to straddle the line between guitars that are within the reality of, of purchasing. I mean, some of those older J45s are in the tens of thousands of dollars. And while that is very cool and they sound very good, it's not, it's just not realistic for, for a lot of folks. And I'm not saying the guitars on here are cheap by any means, but I wanted to put it in the realm of, I don't know, 1,000 to eight to $10,000, somewhere in that range. Anyways, I rest my case. I know there are exceptions. I just wanted to explain myself and maybe give a disclaimer right off the bat. Okay, moving to number nine. Number nine is another newly made guitar. Coming in at number nine is the Keb Mo Bluesmaster. This is an oddball. Uh, I don't believe this guitar is made anymore. However, I feel like this guitar was magic. I think the aesthetics were spot on, and I think the tone generated by the small body guitar was indeed masterful in the blues department. I absolutely loved this guitar when it came out. I'm not sure they made all too many of them. I believe they made them in the natural finish and a sunburst finish. I favored the sunburst, but ultimately what made me pick this guitar is the tone. So let's hear it. Mm -hmm. 
Coming in at the number eight spot is another blues machine, the Gibson L1, both the newly made Gibson L1 and the actual vintage Gibson L1. Because the vintage ones are harder to come by, I wanted to include both models in this spot. And ironically, the newly made Gibson L1 is no longer being made either. I believe that the bodies had to be custom made and there were no rim assemblies for the L1. Therefore, it made producing these guitars in any mass quantity rather difficult. Now, keep in mind, the Gibson L1 has a very round lower bout, an extremely thin waist, and it produces a unique tone. I almost said very unique tone, and I know that's a big grammatical no-no. Um, but it, the, the L1 produces a unique tone. It's very boxy, it's very direct in terms of projection, and it has this wonderful bark. The L1 is the Robert Johnson guitar. So let's go ahead and listen to both of these models. Here's a newly made Gibson L1. I believe they made these back in 2011, 2012, somewhere in there. They don't make them anymore to the best of my knowledge, but they were a treat to play. They are a treat to play if you can find one used. Check it out. Now to get a sense of the true magic of a vintage L1, here's one from 1929. Number seven spot is held by a weirdo, the Roy Smeck Stage Deluxe. This is a deeper bodied guitar. This is a bigger guitar. It sounds like a piano. This guitar produces an unmistakable sound that is so complete, it is mind blowing. I'm talking jaw on the floor. Here's one from 1935. Oh, sounds good. Coming in at number six is the True Vintage Southern Jumbo. Disclaimer, this is a new guitar made to sound old, and I'm not sure what this guitar translates to in the current Gibson lineup. I believe they have now opted for year-specific vintage models, but the one that I played that knocked my socks off was entitled the True Vintage Southern Jumbo. In fact, I used to own one, and I loved it. I love the aesthetic and I love the tone. It's a J45, but really dressed up. And the neck profile is subtly different as well. The split parallelogram inlays always got me. And I just thought that this guitar was a, a statement maker of sorts. Uh, so let's go ahead and give it a listen. The king of all flat tops comes in at number five. Yes, the J200, but which model of the J200? If you guessed the true vintage J200, you guessed correctly. Yes, the true vintage J200 comes in at number five, and you're thinking to yourself, Tone, all you're doing is listing off the true vintage models. Kinda, kinda, because I love them. I loved them and still do, whatever the equivalent is in the modern day Gibson lineup. Uh, the true vintage models were great because you got that vintage tone, you got that vintage look, but you had less problems. Again, I'm not saying that an actual vintage J200 is not good. They're amazing, but can be cost prohibitive. And with a true vintage guitar comes a lot of repairs and, and, and things that kind of are 
well, you know, those oddball things, like an old car that you kind of had to smack on the side to uh, get the radio to come in. That's kind of what a vintage guitar is. It's not a negative thing. You just have to know that going into getting a vintage guitar. And that's why I like the True Vintage series so much. Again, I'm not sure what that translates to to the current Gibson lineup, but I do know that they are making, uh, whether they call it the historic collection or the legend collection, they change stuff so much I can't keep up. But anyways, the number five spot, the J200 True Vintage. All the J200 tone that you want, and it comes in at a pretty nice price when comparing to actual vintage J200s. It's called the King of Flat Tops for a reason, and well, here's the reason why. vintage for number four. Coming in at number four is the Gibson L4. This is a carved top guitar with an oval sound hole that has one of the most distinct sounds you will ever hear. It's chunky, it's thunky, it's got drive, it's almost got this brash sound, but in a good way. And you've probably heard this guitar on a lot of old blues recordings for good reason. It speaks very loudly. This guitar is like it's like having a megaphone in a way, but it still retains some warmth and some woodiness. I know it sounds like a juxtaposition and it, it kind of is. These guitars aren't all too easy to come by. Uh, the one you're gonna listen to right now is from 1928. It is in superb condition and it sounds superb as well. <laughs> My heart beats so that I can hardly speak And I seem to find the happiness I seek the remainder of my list is composed of vintage guitars. Yes, the next three instruments are all of vintage nature. Coming in at number three is the Gibson LC, the Century of Progress model. This is a small bodied guitar. Think L00, but dressed up for the ball. This is one of the most visually striking guitars you will ever see. Originally designed for the Chicago World's Fair, this guitar is a statement maker to say the least, both in looks and in tone. And you'll hear what I'm talking about when you actually hear it being played. Here it is. Crazy enough, I just thought of this. I had a chance to play one of those Century of Progress models in Chicago. No, not at the World's Fair. Uh, I was in Chicago, this was probably five or six years ago. I went to Chicago Music Exchange, they had one in stock, and I thought to myself, I had to play it. It's one of those guitar geek obligations that you have. It was cool to play a guitar that was designed for the Chicago World's Fair in Chicago. I don't know, it's pretty cool. I didn't, I didn't buy it. I, I mean, I wanted to, but, but I didn't. Anyways, let's move on to number two. Coming in at number two is a vintage L00. Did I specify a year? No, not really, because all vintage L00s that I have played are awesome. They have this warmth, they have this woodiness, yet they have this proud tone. They speak up, they speak clearly, they are fantastic for finger style. I'm talking ragtime, I'm talking blues, I'm talking old, early ragtime, jazzy stuff. These guitars quite simply sound awesome. And if you're not finger styly, finger styly? If you're not into finger style, you can strum these and they have just as much bark, just as much bite, and they actually flat pick pretty well also. Pretty versatile guitar, and in terms of the vintage market, I still feel like these can be got at a very good price. They're not cheap, but they're not as expensive as other uh, vintage instruments. So let's go ahead and listen to one. You're going to hear one from 1941. And I, just a special note, this is the last year of production for the Gibson L00. It was later replaced with the Gibson LG2. Okay, let's give it a listen. <laughs>
Okay, we've arrived at the number one spot, and I guarantee you have not guessed the instrument that occupies it. It is a vintage instrument. It is a smaller bodied guitar, and it is not made by Gibson. Actually, it is, but it doesn't appear to be made by Gibson. Coming in at number one is the Kalamazoo KG-11. This is a smaller bodied guitar, but it isn't, it's an odd bodied guitar. Yes, it has this wonderful, I don't know, pear shape. Is that fair to say? It's kind of a pear shaped guitar and it has a striking, striking tonal profile. It's clear, it's stringy in a way, but it still has wonderful body to it. So it cuts, I mean, I'm talking it cuts. Flat picking, it cuts like a laser. Finger picking, it cuts like something like a laser. That's different, but the same. You get the idea, it has a wonderful cutting tone. It's a guitar that's not necessarily easy to find, and it is a guitar that I've had the chance to play, a true vintage one, and wow, what an experience. Now. Quick note before we listen to the Kalamazoo KG-11, one from 1935 to be exact, you can get a similar tone in a modern made guitar. The Iris DE-11, the Iris Dan Erlewine signature is modeled after a Kalamazoo KG-11. In fact, the Iris DE-11 is modeled after a Kalamazoo KG-11 from 1937. But right now, for the sake of purity, you're gonna hear a Kalamazoo KG-11 from 1935. Here it is. All right, there's my list. Time for you to go ahead and rip it to shreds. Yes, go ahead and rip it to shreds in the comments below. I'm just kidding. I mean, of course, you might take exception to some of the guitars on there, and that's totally okay. We're all guitar geeks. We're entitled to our own opinions. But of course, I wanna know your favorite Gibson acoustic guitar. The, your favorite Gibson acoustic guitar that you ever played. Go ahead and let me know in the comments below. It's now time to grab your guitar and see what the TAC family is working on today. See, every day within Tony's Acoustic Challenge, we focus on one of the five essential categories of guitar improvement. Mondays is a technique challenge, Tuesdays a guitar lick challenge, Wednesdays an improvisation challenge, Thursdays a rhythm guitar challenge, and Fridays a chord transition challenge. But this week, things are a little different because the TAC fam is going through a five-day bass walk challenge. Yes, a unique challenge that shows you how to bass walk from chord to chord. So here's a quick sample of what they're learning today. As I mentioned, the TAC family is in the midst of a five-day bass walk challenge. That means every single day this week, the TAC fam is working on a different way to get from one chord to another chord using bass notes as the transition. Now, the transition that they're working on today uses a four-note window. That's actually the title a four note window bass walk. Let me go ahead and play it for you. And then I wanna zoom out and show you how you can use this in your guitar journey. Not just with the chords I mentioned here, but from one chord to, to any chord really. So let me go ahead and play it and then we'll dig into the details. So as you can hear, it's a nice way to jaunt from one chord to the next. Now, before I dig into the details of this, TAC fam, if you wanna learn this note for note, please go ahead and log in. This is your daily challenge. Click Start Challenge, that'll take you immediately to the teaching video. Once you're there, learn it note for note, and then go ahead and move to the play along video. Don't forget to adjust the speed in that lower right-hand corner to a speed that's comfortable for you, and then also in that lower right-hand corner is a place that you can click on the tab, pull that up right next to the video so you can have both side by side and learn it as best you can. Okay, so what is actually happening here? Well, essentially what I'm doing is taking an entire measure to move from one chord to another chord. 
Why would you do this? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, it makes your rhythm guitar playing far more interesting and much more dynamic. It's not just playing a chord, playing a chord, playing a chord, changing, playing a chord, playing a chord, playing a chord. It's taking a, a full measure to move from one chord to the next. That's the first reason you would wanna do this. The second reason you would wanna do this is that it helps out your fellow guitar players. If you're playing in a song circle, if you're playing with one of your friends, this lets them know that a chord transition is coming. And by virtue of this chord transition taking an entire measure, it truly does lead the listener to the next chord or lead, again, your fellow guitar players. So let's go ahead and see what's happening. I'm just gonna use one example from what I played, and that's moving from an A major chord to a D major chord. That sounds like this. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play that again, but I'm gonna count with it because I want you to hear how long the transition takes. Okay, here's the same exact thing, but I'm gonna go ahead and count with it. One, two, and three, four, and one, two, three, four, one, two, and three, four, and. So as you can tell, it takes a full measure. I keep, I keep emphasizing that because it's so important. The transition is quite drawn out. If you've listened to any uh, cowboy, singer, songwriter type, any old country, this was a mainstay, going from chord to chord using transitions like these. It's kind of the slow loping transition. Okay, great. Now, how do I use this in my playing? That's probably what you're asking right now. Well, First and foremost, I want you to use this in your playing. Uh, you can take exactly what I did there, and whenever you see an A to a D transition, use exactly what I used. But I want you to zoom out for a second, and I wanna just explain what's happening, because this will allow you to use this transition approach between any chord you want, okay? All you have to know is the root of the chord that you're on and the root of the chord that you're going to. Okay, so in the case of this A major to D major, I'm starting on an A note, and then I'm walking up to a D note. Right? So it's A, two, three, four, D. So the one is the root of the chord that you're on. The two, three, four lead up to the root of the chord that you're going to and you can apply this to any chord transition you want to. G to C is a great one, uh, really any chord that you want to. I'll go ahead and play one, well, I'll, I'll use that exact example. I'll play G to C so you can see this spelled out in a different scenario. It would sound like this. you saw it from a G to C, and then again, a C to a G. Just a really fun way to move from chord to chord. Okay, before we get back into the show, I wanna talk to you, I wanna encourage you to sound bad. Record scratch, brake squeal, I know, it's weird. You're, you're thinking, Tone, you teach guitar, you're, you're a guitar guide, you help me with my guitar journey, why are you telling me to sound bad? Sounding bad is the key to getting better. Let me explain. Sounding bad means that you're working on something new, something you've never done before. And when you work on something you've never done before, that means you're trying something new and that new thing is something you can add to your repertoire, you can add to your skill set, which means you're expanding your skill set, which means you're getting better. However, I will say this, sounding bad isn't as easy as it sounds. Okay, sounding bad is very difficult because it's extremely uncomfortable. As we sit and play guitar, as you sit and play guitar, you might be thinking, okay, I'm gonna try something new. And you try it maybe one or two times, it sounds like garbage, and immediately you retract and go to the things that you already know how to play that sound really good. That's what I want you to fight. I want you to fight that urge to revert to the things that make you feel comfortable. Because within that, that little discomfort is where true growth happens. So my challenge to you this week, is for 10 minutes, 
Each day that you play, I want you to try something new and sit in the discomfort. It will feel like an eternity, but I promise if you do this for a week, you will be blown away at the new skills that you are able to do and how much progress that you achieve. Let's go ahead and step in the way back machine. We're gonna go all the way back to Acoustic Tuesday episode 241 where I shared my 10 favorite acoustic albums from the 1980s. Now, I always thought that lists really ruffled some feathers. Well, it turns out that this list ruffled a whole flock of feathers. We're gonna get to some of those comments here in a moment, but first, um, let's go to a comment from that show uh, from Stuart Richardson. He says this, Hey Tony, thanks for today's Acoustic Tuesday. In particular, your thoughts on today's story from TAC family member Johnny. I've been a TAC member for a year and a half, and there are times when I tune out your urges for us to be positive. Well, I have been well, I have been having some pretty negative self-talk about my guitar playing, and your words today truly hit me. Is this, playing guitar, fulfilling and enriching my life? And I gotta say, yes. So today, I'm okay with my journey. Thank you for the words, Stuart. Uh, Stuart, thanks for watching, and I'm glad that that resonated with you. And I know, I, you know, each and every show, I try and cite something to help you be more positive on your journey. Not just you, Stuart, but you who are watching the Acoustic Tuesday show. Sometimes it lands, sometimes it doesn't. But I just want to be, well, I want to be your guide. I want to be your, your cheerleader as you go through your guitar journey, because honestly, we all need it. We go through ups and downs. We go through these moments of self-doubt and... Well, I wanna be here for you because honestly, you are all here for me. Uh, you, you, the Acoustic Tuesday viewing audience has helped me through downs in my guitar playing. You have motivated me. So it's really a two-way street. Stuart, thanks so much for your comment. Okay, next up is another comment. This one comes from Todd Borger. He says this, Jerry Douglas didn't appear as a regular member of the Bluegrass album band until volume three. Was he a guest on volume one? I don't know. I do, and he wasn't, and you are correct, Todd. Thank you for the correction. Uh, Bluegrass Album Band is a phenomenal uh, a series of albums, series of uh, players, really, but Jerry Douglas didn't join the Bluegrass Album Band until Volume 3. Luckily enough for me, I can cover my, my tail a little bit because Volume 3 came out in the 80s. So kind of, kind of okay scooting by on that one. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Another comment here from Mike. He says, for heaven's sake, Tony, Dan Fogelberg's High Country Snows, yeah, I missed that one. I gotta be honest with you. I missed that one on this particular list. That is actually one of my favorite albums. I remember listening to that album on tape while my family drove out to the West for vacation. I had to be, I don't know, eight years old or something like that. And I just remember um, that, that album just being so significant, both because of the vacation we were on, but also because it just kind of struck me. I wasn't necessarily into music then, but I just remember being like, ah, I kind of like that. My foot's kind of tapping. I don't know what that feeling is, but I kind of like it. Anyways, uh, good recommendation, Mike. I can't believe I forgot that one. Uh, next comment comes from Got Bean. Tony, were you born in 1983? If so, you look great for your age. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I was born in 1983, uh, which makes me uh, right on the cusp of 40. Yeah, I never thought I would say that, but here I am saying that to you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, now now we got to get into some of these gripes. These are uh, also from that episode, the best acoustic albums of the 80s. And uh, we're going to get to this first one from Steve Eckert. Tony Rice, Ricky Skaggs, Michael Hedges. Totally no room in that list for Springsteen's Nebraska. Springsteen's Nebraska, huh? Just because it's mainstream doesn't make it bad. SMH, just unsubscribed. I'm sorry you took offense to that. I... I Deeply apologize that my omission of Bruce Springsteen's album, Nebraska, caused you to unsubscribe. Uh, that stinks. I'm sorry. Um, but I got to be honest. I got to be honest here. This is, I'm, really, I'm really just coming out of my shell right now. What if I told you I never heard Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska album? I can hear half of the audience going, <gasps> but it's true. I never heard it. I didn't really grow up with Bruce Springsteen. Uh, my dad never listened to Bruce Springsteen, so therefore, I really didn't. And now here I am, and I, I still haven't listened to the album. However, it was recommended quite a few times in that show's comments, so it's on my list to listen to. And that's the beauty of these lists. What I like might not be what you like, but what I like might expose you to new music. And that's why I ask you to leave comments, because your comments help me discover new music. 
even if it was released, gosh, 40 years ago? Is that when the 80s were? <laughs> yeah, it is, because I'm, I'm gonna turn 40 here at some point. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, another one from Sam Vecchio says this, Bruce Springsteen, Nebraska, 1982. But the grass in New Jersey isn't blue. So why would you mention that one? Yes, my list was infused with bluegrass, okay? I'm sorry. I'm, I, no, I'm not sorry. I'm not going to apologize. I just, I'm, I just feel bad for the Bruce, Springsteen's fan, Bruce Springsteen fans that I offended. I didn't mean to offend you. I just never heard the album. I just didn't. I, I'm going to now, though. I feel, like, I feel like I haven't lived because I haven't heard this album. But don't, rest assured, I'm gonna listen. I am gonna listen. It's on my list to listen. Okay, anyways, let's, let's hop on the Acoustic Tuesday private jet. And you know what? Let's, let's go ahead and cue up, cue up some Bruce Springsteen Nebraska album because we can all hear it. As we ride down to Beaver Creek, Ohio, we're gonna visit Buck Wicker and take a look at his guitar snow. He says this, hi, Tony. I'm finally getting around to showing my fellow guitar geeks my guitar snow. I took this photo on my front porch wearing this cool t-shirt. On the left of the photo is a 1975 Guild D25M, which I bought brand new. I'm holding my most recent acquisition, which was a gift from my 94-year-old mother about a year and a half ago, a 1975 Martin D35 equipped with an LR Bags pickup. I play the D35 regularly as I play in the Praise and Worship band at my church. On the right is a 2004 Alvarez RD8C, which I also bought brand new. I watch you on YouTube every week. Be nice and play guitar. Guitar Geeks Unite. Buck, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for sharing your guitar snow. And I have to tell you, I love your guitar snow. It's three guitars, but three guitars that pack a punch. Two from 1975, and I love it. I love that you have your first guitar, and I love that the, uh, the D35 was a gift from your mom. I mean, that's so cool. You don't have to have a ton of guitars, but the guitars that you do have can mean a whole heck of a lot. And that is the case with Buck's Guitar Snow for sure. Buck, thank you again for sharing. And if you're sitting there thinking, I wanna be like Buck, I wanna have my Guitar Snow featured on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Here's how you do that. I wanna to propose to you a win, win, win scenario. I wanna feature you on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Yes, I wanna feature you and your guitar snow or you and your Acoustic Tuesday merchandise. Step number one, go to tonypolacastro.com forward slash shop. Once you're there, pick out your favorite guitar snow shirt, your favorite Acoustic Tuesday merchandise, get it shipped directly to your door. Step number two, once your merchandise arrives, go ahead and put it on and take a picture of yourself, either just wearing Acoustic Tuesday merchandise, or if you have a guitar snow shirt, take a picture in front of all of your guitars. And then once you're done with that, step number three is to upload your picture at tonypolacastro.com forward slash shop. There's a link right on that page. Click it, you can upload your photo, and boom, you'll be featured in the Acoustic Tuesday show. Win number one, you get featured in the Acoustic Tuesday show. Win number two, you get some cool snazzy Guitar Geek merchandise. Win number three, the biggest win of them all, all proceeds from the TonyPolacastro.com forward slash shop are being donated to Guitars for Vets. You get featured in the show, you get cool new shirts, cool new merchandise, and you help out Guitars for Vets. Win, win, win. Okay, back to the show. It's time for your weekly dose of acoustic news you can use. And I have a whole pile of news I have to get through, so today's show might just go a little bit longer and that's just gonna have to be okay. First up on my list is an epic onstage guitar goof. Kirk Hammett, the guitarist of Metallica, was playing the famous intro to Nothing Else Matters. And what happened? He goofed up, he goofed up. It just shows that it happens to the best of us. And I love this because he got up and the crowd embraced it. And when I say he got up, because he actually, he fell over. Um, and it's just, I thought it was a really sweet human moment. You know, a lot of times these, these large level bands, these huge performers, we expect this perfection. We expect things to go super precisely, but we're all humans trying to do our best, just like Kirk Hammett is in this video. Sorry, you guys are so kick-ass, I got distracted by how kick-ass. 
Next up, some new music from my dear friends, Dead Horses. Yes, Sarah and Dan have been writing, and they have a new album coming out August 12th. It's entitled Brady Street, and they just released their first single off of this album. So let's go ahead and give it a listen. Just so happens to be the title track of the album. Here's their new song, Brady Street. My mind's been so busy, and I can get so angry. Sometimes it really strikes me. Everybody stand this I think I'd like a night swim Oh, there it is again New Resonator guitars are coming out of Maryland. Yes, the folks at Beard Guitars just announced a new lineup of instruments, the Radio Standard line. What they did is they took their five most popular guitars and made a dressed down version that comes in at a sweeter price point. You've got two square necks, you've got three round necks, you've got a mix of spider cones, biscuit cones, this, this is something I am very excited about because we just did a show, or I just did a show on the best resonator guitars ever made. I absolutely love beard guitars, but I do understand that some of their instruments fall in a price category that's prohibitive. But this particular lineup brings their instruments a little bit more within reach. By no means are these cheap instruments, okay? First of all, they're not coming out of a factory. This is, this is a small crew, we're talking 10 folks building these guitars to exact specifications. The fit and finish on these instruments is incredible. And the fact that they're offered at a lower price point is pretty sweet. And these guitars sound just as stunning as the higher end models. In fact, let's go ahead and listen to Trey Hensley play one right now. Next up, more new guitars. These ones come from the folks at Atkins Guitars. Yes, just across the pond, they just released their Dust Bowl series. And holy smokes, did these guitars just launch to the top of my list to try out. Yes, indeed. When I'm in Chicago at the end of August for the Fretboard Summit, I hope, I hope, fingers crossed, that Chicago Music Exchange has some of these instruments because they look stunning. Go ahead and check out these pictures while I read to you the description. Our 20s inspired all mahogany range brings you a true vintage feel. Available in single O, double O, triple O 12 fret slotted headstocks and 14 fret solid headstocks. With our new Fuller Soft V neck profile, all models come with Indian Rosewood fretboard and bridge and are finished with our, su our super thin aged nitro. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Uh, I just became a, a recent owner of an Atkins guitar, uh, the 43 model, which is modeled after a J45, and I am stunned. I'm absolutely stunned by this instrument. It blows me away, so I cannot wait to get my hands on one of these. Uh, next up is another guitar from the folks at Atkins. This one is very limited, and you'll see why here in a moment. I want to show you this video. This is Alistair showing off one of their 12 Cities guitars. This guitar isn't for everybody, but it is certainly one for a collector because it is very much a one of a kind. Check it out. This is number one of our 12 Cities project. This is Nashville. It's got this really cool style. She's invented this whole sort of uh, pattern. Um, it's all painted with acrylics. Um, on the side here it says Nashville. And then on the back here you've got this zip with a, with a hand signed um, signature by Jane. We've got Grand Old Opry on the side here and Tennessee right here. 
Um, the guitar is made from mahogany back and sides and it's got a Sitka spruce top. Um, the headstock there you can see says Nashville 1. So this is a truly original guitar. There is only one of these in the world. A very cool instrument. I thought this next find was rather fitting for today's show. It's a collage of sorts of Gibson built off brand guitars. Here's what the caption says I found this on the uh, Instagram profile Vintage Gibson Acoustic, all one word. Uh, here's what it says From the 30s to the beginning of World War II, Gibson built a lot of off brand guitars. Some are well known, like Kalamazoo Recording King or Carson J. Robeson, but there are also some lesser known names with only a few surviving examples. I put some of them together, but there are way more. I just thought that was really cool. I wanted to share it with you. Some of these were ones that I had never heard of. I had never heard of Capital. I had never heard of Andy Sinella, and I never heard of Henry L. Mason. So pretty rad stuff I wanted to share with you. Uh, all right, next up, what do I have? Oh, next up, speaking of Iris guitars, you know, Iris makes that DE-11 that's modeled after a 1937 KG-11 Kalamazoo guitar. Well, check this out. Uh, they're able to get their hands on some pretty awesome Brazilian rosewood. And here's the story. Brazilian rosewood is one of our favorite woods for backs and sides. Being a very expensive wood, it is hard to make an iris guitar with this material and keep the price point we strive for. We want our customers to be able to afford and play a Brazilian rosewood guitar. Luckily, with Allied Luthier in the same building, we are able to utilize some of the material that isn't perfectly book matched or cut from the same pieces or boards. We all know wood is a precious resource and we want to use every bit of it we can to make you an affordable guitar you will love to play. Going forward, we are happy to do a Brazilian rosewood upgrade, but only use the wood that isn't perfect. Because honestly, what is perfect these days? Uh, how cool is this? I mean, I, I am a fan of Iris guitars. Uh, and to see that you're able to get Brazilian rosewood, although it's not perfect, but honestly, who cares? It's about the tone, right? Guitar could be pink, but if it sounds awesome, not that there's anything wrong with a pink guitar, don't get me wrong, but if, if a guitar sounds awesome, then it's one that you probably want in your guitar arsenal. Anyways, I wanted to share this with you because what awesome news and how cool that Iris Guitar shares a, a building or is in close vicinity to Allied Luthery. It's like a superhero team. It's like a match made in heaven. Superhero X-Men of guitar building. All right, next up, I'm gonna keep the news, it's just gonna keep coming. I have two more bluegrass infused news pieces because uh, there was a comment earlier about how I only feature bluegrass and I thought to myself, why would I not feature a music that I love and a music that maybe not a lot of folks know about? So I'm gonna feature a little bit more bluegrass. I don't know, it's guitar related, so I think you'll dig it. Uh, this, <laughs> this next one is a Tony Rice break that I found. It's a solo that he took on a song. I don't even know what song it is uh, because my jaw was on the floor and I think my brain stopped working. Um, I started following this account, uh, Tony, Un I think it's called Tony Unit. I gotta find it here, see if I can find it really quick. Uh, yeah, it's called Tony underscore units and it just features Tony Rice stuff. Well, they posted this break that he took that was like, it's like Tony went to a different planet and then somehow came back. Uh, check it out. Is that everybody's cup of tea? Maybe, maybe not, but holy smokes, you gotta admire the technical proficiency and his ability to just do that in a song, on stage, with some of the best players around him. Pretty awesome stuff. One more news story for you. It comes from Thompson Guitars. Yes, the fine guitar makers in Sisters, Oregon. Guess who just visited them? Just popped in the shop for a surprise visit? Billy Strings, yeah. And here's some footage of him playing in the front of the shop.
I should probably mention that the guitar he's playing is Preston's own 1980 0012 fret with Brazilian rosewood back and sides. Yeah, pretty awesome stuff. And I think on that note, it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show for today, this extended version of the Acoustic Tuesday show. Um, let's go ahead and take a quick sneak peek and to see a quick sneak peek to see what I'll be talking about next week. Holy cow, this is why things don't go over a half hour. Um, next week, we'll be learning some guitar lessons from my dear friend, Charlie Parr. Yes, I'll be looking at his guitar playing style and teaching you some of the things that he does. Now, I am not Charlie Parr, but I've taken some little morsels of his playing and I wanna share them with you because I think it's something that, well, you can add to your playing to add some diversity and infuse it with a little folk and blues. That's happening next week. Remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time right here on YouTube. And before I let you go, please do remember this. Your guitar success, however you define it, is directly related to your guitar routine. So please invest the time in developing your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day that you play. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for sharing your time with me. And of course, thank you for sharing your time with me. Wow, I am all backwards today. Anyways, I appreciate you being a guitar geek and I appreciate you, you know, sharing your Tuesday with me, which is just like sharing your time with me. I gotta go, I'm speaking in circles. I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Cheers, be nice and play guitar.